So we're, we're really excited to have a really fascinating talk, and, and I'm going to give a little bit of a background as to, to how we got to this. So uh, about, about four or five years ago, the, the Homeland Security and the National Science Foundation were looking to team up on some really innovative, groundbreaking, breaking projects. And uh, you know, it's not usual for two agencies to come together and jointly fund a project, but, uh, but we were looking for ones that were had a especially strong potential future growth, and we're looking at areas that, that at the time we thought were sort of really underserved, but, but potentially really critical. And uh, there were tons of proposals that, we were, that, that came in on that, and, uh, and only, only three that were selected as sort of projects that really should get funded, and one of them uh, was, was a precursor of some of this. Um, on secure and smart manufacturing, and, and, and that is a fascinating and important topic. And I'm going to try not to not to spoil things from from Chris and Jules, but uh, you know, uh, you know, as as we'll see throughout this, this is a huge area. If you are looking for an interesting topic, if you're looking for an interesting problem, you almost could not find anything more interesting than this. Uh, it's got we are the technology, cybersecurity, and policy program. This has all of those. Okay. So technology, you know, manufacturing, you know, it's not, there are very few things that are being manufactured by the, the hand chisel nowadays, right? You know, the, uh, so huge amount of technology here. Cybersecurity, we're going to see a ton of interesting stuff on securing manufacturing systems. Policy also comes into this, which is, you know, how do you even, you know, what are the requirements, right? You know, so we, we want our, we want any of our manufacturing devices to, to meet certain criteria, to be, to be secure, to be safe, and uh, and, and there's a fascinating challenge here. And so, so it's it's great to have sort of you know, two of I would say you know, two out of the two out of the three people who are really securing this, you know, who are creating this area. This is a foundational area on how do you make manufacturing systems secure and what are the security threats. And so, uh, yeah. So so Chris and Jules. Uh, along with, with Jaime and also at Virginia Tech. So, so Jules White, Vanderbilt University, uh, Chris Williams, Virginia Tech, uh, bring together sort of exactly what we want to build in this program. Amazing cybersecurity expertise, amazing technical expertise, an understanding of how it all fits in policy-wise. Uh, you know, both uh, faculty at, you know, Jules is at Vanderbilt, uh, Chris is at Virginia Tech. And uh, with that, I think, you know, I would, there's so much more I would love to say about this, but we brought them here, today, so you want to hear from them, not from me. So with that, I'll hand it over to the first like Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a fantastic uh, introduction. And so this is a, a, a really fascinating area. And the way that, that we got started with this was there was a, a seed grant at Virginia Tech that said, let's go look at something in cybersecurity and manufacturing. And Chris and Jaime and I, we didn't know each other, although Chris and Jaime maybe have no, known each other, and we got together in the room and started looking at cybersecurity and manufacturing. And initially, it was kind of fun. It was just like, why don't you come see what you can do to break our labs and our expensive equipment? And it sort of snowballed from there of, of learning really interesting things about cybersecurity and manufacturing. So I'm the, you know, this was funded underneath the cyber physical systems and homeland security um, sort of uh, combined partnership and cyber physical security. So I'm the cyber side of this uh, relationship. Chris and Jaime were the physical side. And so we were really looking at um, trying to figure out the interesting problems in the cyber physical aspect, where the two intersect and how we could use physical mechanisms to enhance cybersecurity and cybersecurity techniques to enhance um, physical aspects of security. So manufacturing isn't something that we normally think about um, in cybersecurity, although there's really a lot that's happened um, from a cybersecurity perspective. So one example that was in the news uh, that you may have seen was there was a German steel foundry that was attacked. And so the attackers took over the steel foundry. And what they actually did is they took control of some of the um, furnaces and uh, took them past their operating range and did permanent physical damage to uh, the plant to where they were offline for a period of time. And there's also, this is a brand new one, I think that happened like a week or two ago. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt, but 
a foundry was on the internet? <laughs> Apparently so. Yeah. Apparently so. So and and got remotely attacked and ta and taken over. Or, or some piece of it was on the uh, control yeah. systems or something. This is the future of, of manufacturing yeah. industry 4.0, connected systems, Internet of Things, so a PLC controller for the induction furnace. And, and I'll tell you, uh, after we show some of the things that we saw, or at least, you know, from my mind, I was like sort of frightening. I mean, it's not, um, I, I'm not at all surprised now that this foundry was, you know, on the Internet and it, that it could be taken over. Um, this is an example, I think, two or three weeks ago, the Triton, uh, malware that's been around for a while started going after uh, safety-based systems in I think this was oil and gas manufacture or refining, and so they were trying they were taking over safety systems in the manufacturing plant and possibly lining up for some type of serious attack on the plant. So these are obviously all really sort of high-profile manufacturing attacks. Of course, we've seen things like Stuxnet, where it was attacks on. Um, uranium, you know, refinement, which is essentially manufacturing. Now, what I'm going to talk about, though, is a little bit of a different angle, and so I want to shift gears giving you my cyber perspective on this. So one of the things that I think is really interesting that started happening in cybersecurity is that we see lots of attacks that are, you know, if I have to go and find a system and then figure out what it's vulnerable to, it takes a lot of work. What if I can compromise the system in advance during the software engineering, which is essentially the software manufacturing stage, and produce a fundamentally flawed plot product that goes out into the world. And so there have been attacks like Dilettante is a tool that will sit on a network and look for Java dependencies being downloaded. If you have like Maven or Gradle as your build tool, typically it'll go and pull those from remote repositories, and it will automatically inject vulnerabilities into libraries and back doors. Um, NPM, the, the Node Package Manager, has had a whole bunch of these uh, examples where a popular package or uh, a new package shows up that has a backdoor baked into it or has logic that's baked into it that's specifically designed to attack developers' machines and then get access to code repositories. And so the idea behind this is why, why you know, try to find a way to break it if you can just inject the flaw into the product from the beginning and then have it go out into the real world. And, that's where you then get your payoff. And so, you, so what I want to say is like, what if this happened to a physical part? So what if the Toyota Prius acceleration incident was actually because a cyber attacker came in and caused some part in the Toyota Prius to be manufactured incorrectly with a design flaw so that you ended up crashing? Now, I don't think that this actually happened for the Toyota Prius. But I, think that's, but I think the fact that it's not easy to tell exactly what happened, and there was so much complexity in trying to debug it, you know, and was it a physical part, was it a software issue, you know, these things are, are hard to diagnose. So if you did create a part that had a fundamental design flaw that, was, that an attacker had injected while the part was being manufactured, you could do really serious damage. And if you randomly did this, you can you know, create distrust in the manufacturer, um, you know, create all kinds of problems for them. So this is the problem that we began looking at is not how do we, you know, protect manufacturing systems from being disrupted, which is, I think of as denial of service. So rather than the denial of service attack, which goes in and bangs up the foundry or, you know, hurts the refinery, what would happen and how do we protect against an attacker coming in and creating something more malicious? I almost think of it as like the advanced persistent threat of the physical world, which is we take something, we intercept it during its manufacturing and we cause flaws to be injected in physical parts so that they go and fail in the field. So that a turbine blade on an engine fails at some point um, where something else malicious happens to gain an economic advantage or some other advantage. So, the reason why this is, is theoretically possible now is because we're a long way from that you know, chisel and hammer version of manufacturing that we may have started with. Um, in order to design the parts and, and things that we're manufacturing, we use all of these complex tools to help us do analyses of them, finite element analyses, all these other things that I don't understand but Chris does from his world. Um, and there's so many different domains where we have specialized tools that help us get the design right that it's really difficult for some engineer to go and look at the finished product and tell, is this exactly what I designed? Does it exactly meet the specification 
that I'm looking for. And when you go and look at, um, for example, 3D printing something, it's not I'm just going to design something on my machine. There's all these different digital steps that happen that they call the digital thread um, in manufacturing. So you go and produce the 3D model. That gets saved as an STL file, which is essentially a common representation of the geometry of that part, um, essentially triangles. Then when you decide you want to go and print that somewhere, that geometry for a 3D printer has to be sliced up into all these different layers that can be actually printed. Um, along the way, there's typically some planning software for the individual printer that's going to decide you know, the strategy for moving the head around, the print head around, or the lasers, the temperatures, all of the configuration. That's all going to be sent to the printer over a network. Um, if you're in a real large manufacturing center, they're going to have network control of all these printers and job allocation. And then at the other end, you finally get this you know, printed object. So it's really far distant, typically, from the designer. And it creates this space and gap where all these different steps happen. And finally, it gets to quality control. And even that is digital in nature in that you know, quality control targets are being sent to these machines. Calibrations are being sent to these machines. All of it's connected. And it's really difficult to see, is this part what I intended to be produced at the beginning, or at some step along the way, did somebody go and attack it in some way? Um, and this is only going to become more and more of a threat as things like additive manufacturing um, continue to take off. So, you know, people are talking about 3D printing houses. Uh, Chris's lab has a robotic arm that can you know, print like 10 foot stuff that's going to print, you know, a, a mock habitat for Mars, you know. Um, and then they're talking about you know, printing in the battlefield for military. They're going to have 3D printers going to print a part right there rather than having to ship it. Or your auto mechanic, you know, they, rather than waiting two days for that part to make it to them, they instead just print it there. So if we care about our physical safety and we're going to continue to spread manufacturing farther and farther out over all these things, we ha really have to pay attention to um, are we securing also the physical products that are coming out. You know, if I go to my auto mechanic and they can't service my car because you know, somebody had a malware attack on them, that's one thing. But if they service my car and put a part in it that caused my brakes to fail, I really, really care about that. OK, so is this a big problem in manufacturing? Surely you know, the German foundry is not connected to the internet. And all these tools, like the recent 3D printers, that they've gotten it right in terms of cybersecurity. Well, one interesting statistic is attacks on manufacturing are certainly um, on the rise. And um, if you go and look at the individual equipment, which is one of the things we did, um, you actually find that the cybersecurity wasn't thought through that well, unfortunately. So and one of the, the things we did initially when we got turned loose to try to figure out what we could do with this type of equipment, um, we looked at brand new 3D printers. So this is some data that we grabbed from, um, I think it's like a $250,000 3D printer that's in Chris's lab. So we intercepted data from it. And when you start intercepting the data, you see all kinds of interesting things. Like, you know, it's sort of the security through obscurity model. They think, oh, well, it's binary. We'll send it. We won't encrypt it. Um, you know, two of our grad students sat down and reverse engineered the protocols. And you start seeing things like, temperature of the heads, the materials that are being used. Um, and you can also get a lot deeper. So this video that I'm about to show you is an example where we did a demo where we man in the middle the traffic going from the print controller to the printer. So this is a 3D printer. This is a $250,000 very recent 3D printer. And um, we intercepted the traffic and did some really interesting things, which if I can get the video to play here. So this is uh, a graduate student um, using Wireshark, which probably a lot of you are familiar with, to go and start um, using ARP spoofing and poisoning to uh, intercept the TCP streams going to this printer, um, which in a minute what we're going to see is they're, they you know, appear uh, obfuscated, but they're actually not encrypted or anything else. So you can get begin going and just using Wireshark to explore this and find, start looking through what's there. And in a minute, he's going to start digging a little deeper. And you can start to see the power of what you can do when you begin intercepting the streams. 
So in a second here, they'll start finding the right stuff. And just as an emphasis, this is just standard Wireshark that you download off the internet that anybody could go and download and begin intercepting traffic for a 3D printer. So now he's figure, starting to figure out where this raw data is that's going into the printer for the print. And you know, these 3D printers, you know, they want to be convenient. So everything's on the network. You don't physically attach to the printer anymore to you know, print to it. You, you know, send commands over the internet, which Chris can do from his house because they always have the ports open um, on these printers. <laughs> Um, because if you need any manufacturing help, you know, the, the manufacturer needs to be able to get to the printer too. So yes, here what we can see is that the grad student has started to decode the traffic going to it. And this is actually the layer data for this part that's being printed over there. So in real time now, we're watching the traffic going to the printer. And these are the individual layers that are being sent to the printer for that part and being decoded in real time. Now there's all that kinds of other stuff about temperature, print temperatures and things, but they've sort of distilled it down into this simple video. So this is a quick example of what unfortunately is possible with um, modern manufacturing equipment. $250,000 buys you something with no encryption um, <laughs> and where the manufacturer tells you to keep the port open so that they can remotely um, diagnose it. Now there's even more interesting things that we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's one example. The other thing is you can go and capture all kinds of real-time data from this printer to see how the print's proceeding. This also can all be spoofed to whoever's listening to it. So the print had temperatures and everything. You can lie about what the printer's doing. This is exactly what they did with Stuxnet where they said the centrifuges are spinning at a certain speed when in reality they were spinning much faster. Um, and even if you do produce the part, well, they're gonna be quality control, right? So we'll catch it at the quality control phase. Well, one is all of the quality control machinery. This is a tensile test where it tries to pull apart a part, or pull apart a part, I, I don't know, mm -hmm. I can't say that, it's like tongue twister. <laughs> and you can actually go and remotely change the calibration of all of these things, which we also did. So once you get into the network and all these things are connected, you can really start doing interesting things. Or just making people distrust their manufacturing by changing the calibration settings so they think all of their prints are failing and they can't figure out why. Um, so there's just a vast amount of attack surface um, in modern manufacturing. Additive manufacturing also has a really interesting attack surface to it because a lot of traditional subtractive manufacturing, you're doing things to the outside of the part to produce it. And so you're typically doing things that are easily visible. With um, additive manufacturing, you can actually do things to the interior of the part that aren't visible. So you can print completely enclosed, you know, like a hollow sphere, for example, you can't see the inside of the sphere. So you can do things on the inside of the part that are impossible to see from the outside. And so they make the quality control and the inspection to detect these types of attacks even harder. So this is an example where um, a simple tensile test specimen, which is this one that was shown right here, this is a common part that'll be um, produced for different testing purposes is being produced and it has a simple interior void that's being put into the, it may be a little bit hard to see, but into the neck of this thing. And I've got some examples of some toys that we uh, printed for one of our DHS PI meetings where we printed two DHS coins. One of them has a flaw in it. Um, one of these types of mechanical flaws, if you wanna pass that around. And it's an exact example of this. So if you can try to hold it up to the light, we, we pr printed these so you could try to detect it, but um, you can actually go through and do really sophisticated attacks um, on additive manufacturing. So I'm going to show you a quick video. Um, this is that tensile test specimen being manufactured. And the one on the top has actually got the void in it, which you can't really see. I mean, if you were really watching this, this particular print closely, maybe you would be able to detect it. But at this point in the print, if you haven't seen it yet, you're, you're obviously not going to see the, the um, void that's been printed into it. And then what's happening here is the actual legitimate uh, tensile test specimen is being stretched by this machine. It's hard to see because it's going slow because it's trying to stretch this thing until it breaks. And in a second, you'll see it pop. Um, and we're almost there. So there it goes, now it popped and failed. And it failed kind of where you would expect um, now we're going to go and test the one that is the one with the void that's been placed in it. And you're going to see that it fails a lot faster. It's already failed, and it failed at the oh. top. 
The other thing that's interesting is where it failed, it shouldn't have failed. It was at a thicker part in the part. So the attacker can actually control um, where it fails, which is obviously a problematic thing. You don't want them to have that type of control over you. Um, the other really interesting thing is, well, are you ever going to see something like malware that does this automatically, the equivalent of like the, you know, these things that lock you up and take away Bitcoin from you? Well, you absolutely <laughs> could. So um, one of the, the graduate students in Chris's group looked at if somebody was going to generate this type of malware, what would be their strategies for attacking the geometry of a part? And actually developed um, and showed that you could use ray tracing um, to determine the interior um, portions of the file and the geometry. And then there were heuristics that you could use to optimize where you would place a void to guarantee that the part is going to be more likely to crack. Um, so there's all kinds of really sophisticated things that could be done automated. So you don't even have to know the design. It could just be looking at these things at scale and applying attacks. Just like malware doesn't necessarily know about your data, but since it starts going in and providing attacks. We also did a lot of work in subtractive manufacturing and also additive manufacturing with human subjects, IRB approved, of course, where we had teams go and try to manufacture different parts while there was um, an attack going on that would change the qualities of the part. Um, and what you found was unless you explicitly told people and tipped them off of what to look for, they would assume the parts were fine, number one. Even if you did tip them off on what quality control things to go and run to try to figure out the problem, then the immediate like, answer that they would have was, oh, well, the machine's miscalibrated. And so they would go and start trying to adjust the machine in the wrong direction <laughs> to fix these issues that they're seeing. So it creates all kinds of problems. And nobody ever thought this could be a cyber attack. There's just a general lack of awareness in manufacturing um, for this. I'll, I'll give a question. Yeah. So isn't the solution never to put anything on a network? <laughs> this is a great question that leads into my next slide. So, <laughs> so the first thing, we, we had a couple partners, and I think I'm getting yeah, uh, the uh, yeah, timings. Right. But the, uh, the, we had a couple partners. This was an additive manufacturing contract printer um, that prints at scale. We did an analysis of their network. They have Windows XP running on there, unpatched, you know, Windows 7, you know, below the lay patch level, all kinds of things. And we said, well, just the first thing you should do is disconnect this thing to the, from the internet. Good. And, the, and the response was, we can't do that. And we said, well, why not? And they said, there's DRM on these printers. And if you disconnect the printer from the internet, the printer doesn't work anymore because the manufacturers of the printers themselves are so worried about their IP on the printer that they require it to be connected to the internet. It's kind of like the games where you have to be connected so the DRM unlocks itself. They have that on the printers. And so they said, we can't unlock it. And um, so there's nothing, you know, we, we can't do that. Um, the other thing we said, okay, we'll update. All these Windows XP, Windows 7, patch them. And this is a, a dose of reality for me, and I would say from a policy perspective, you know, a dose of reality is you go to a manufacturer and you say, look, you, you need to update this old thing over there. And they say, well, the, the person that produced that piece of equipment that we paid a million dollars for does not have an update for it. Not only that, it's in production. And we can't take it out of production, and we're going to amortize that thing over 10 or 20 years. We can't do that. Um, and, and they're literally strapped. They have the, the, their, their option is I could take some huge cost or maybe go out of business, or I could try to do an upgrade, and they can't really do that. And I say, look, we can barely get the upgrades for our cell phones right, and our cell phones are like, oh, I guess they're like $2,000 if you get the right Apple one with all the Apple Care now. But you know, older Android phones, you probably aren't getting updates for it, depending on the manufacturer. Maybe you got them for two years. Manufacturers need 10, 20 years of updates. And we break everything all the time when we update. And they can't have things broken once all these manufacturing facilities are tuned. So it's really hard. The other thing you'll see is that some of these manufacturing facilities will get set up. And then the knowledge that went into the setup of them is long gone. The people have left. Nobody really quite understands how all this stuff works. And they're just sort of keeping it running you know, 20 years later. And they can't even go in and do the um, upgrades. One of the other things that often comes up is people will say, well, isn't this just a quality control problem? At the end of the day, the cyber attack is going to come out as a change in the part. And the answer is, is that unfortunately, all the quality control mechanisms are typically optimized for the belief that machines fail in a certain way. They don't drill extra holes. They drill holes that are 
have the wrong surface roughness or the wrong size because the tool has worn out. But if you go and drill an extra hole, a 101st hole in that part, the people that are doing the quality control aren't looking for that because the machines just don't fail in that way. So when you start doing really malicious things, like a cyber attack would do, quality control in manufacturing isn't designed to handle this. So we did lots of bad things. We showed lots of bad things can be done, and we're worried about it. What can we do to fix this? So we really started scoping out two key things. I'll talk about the first piece of this, and then Chris is going to take over in a second. Um, one is understanding what are all the risks and mapping this out, and then trying to provide tools that could go and analyze the risks to individual parts. Um, so going from vulnerability all the way down to this specific aspect of this part could be changed by an attack. But if you changed quality control in these ways, you could detect those types of attacks or protect the most vulnerable surfaces. Um, and then the second part, Chris will talk about some of the interesting physical techniques we use to tie into cybersecurity. So one of the things that we did was looking at modeling tools where you would model all of these manufacturing processes and their relationship to the different facets of the part um, and then performance characteristics of those facets so that we could go and show manufacturers why they should care about changing quality control. Because changing and updating in all of the cyber infrastructure often wasn't possible, but changing quality control is something that they can do and that they do do all the time. So if you can tell them why they should change it and give them a concrete um, understanding of that, it's really valuable to them. So this is a quick demo. This is a modeling tool that we put together that allows you to go and design um, and model the processes that they're using in manufacturing and parts and aspects of the parts. So we've got someone who's just creating a simple um, model for a part. And the interesting thing in a minute here after the complete model is done is it's going to take that model and an understanding of the cyber systems behind it and software versions. It's, it also is building essentially a software catalog. And then it's going to give them a recommendation in terms of here are the vulnerabilities you're exposed to, which is something that manufacturers really needed to see. But also here's how it could impact your parts. Um, and then we also had things for doing recommendations on quality control. So in a second, the person will go and finish this thing up and do the vulnerability assessment. And this is going and running um, against the NIST vulnerability database. It's showing all of the different aspects of this particular part that's being manufactured that could be impacted by a cyber attack. And then these are all then connected back to specific um, CVEs that have been released and are known so that you can go and sort of understand um, the attack surfaces of your, your process and what can be done to fix it. So with that, I think I'm going to. Um, Turn it over to Chris. Okay. To... All right, thanks, Jules. <laughs> oh, he'll be back up. All right, yeah, Jules will get back up. So as Jules mentioned, so it's been a really interesting collaboration. Uh, we had a lot to learn from Jules uh, because answer your question about why we don't disconnect things from the network is because in our world, the future of manufacturing is industry 4.0. It's all connected systems. That's how we're going to get better efficiencies better energy, you know, uh, energy efficiency, better production efficiency. That's how we do distributed manufacturing along the supply chain. That's how we do you know, apply uh, machine learning to make our processes more uh, smart, right? Just like Tesla does. We want to bring all that data in, aggregate it, and then do firmware upgrades. Uh, so we learned a lot about why that's what the challenge is. People are making those decisions maybe without the knowledge of the cyber world. So we did all the red teaming. We did all the assessment tools. The next piece, though, is to start doing the defense, the mitigation strategies. And I should mention that we're really a cyber physical team. We're not a cyber team only. So uh, when you ask the, I'll never forget in one of these early meetings, because one of our first jobs was to convince and make those aware in, you know, in, in, in industry that this is an important problem to solve. And I'll never forget the answer was, well, we use Norton antivirus. <laughs> You know, and so, yes, they're, you know, and then they would use, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I can make fun of our, uh, myself, you know, oh, we'll just use a firewall, right? You know, not knowing what actually what that does. Uh, and so the point was a cyber solution only is really just putting sort of a temporary wall in front. We're getting to the point where we know someone will get through. And it could be on the inside, it could be on the outside, but we really want to focus on that cyber physical interaction where the cyber rules turn into a physical product. At the end of the day, what we really want to do, it sounds really simple, all we want to do is pick up any part and prove that we know who designed it and that the thing that we've made matches the design, not just the shape, but the material properties. That's a very important piece. 
and that it meets all of our expectations. So right now, people in manufacturing think that we do this through quality control. And when you talk to industry, they all were very afraid of, anti of counterfeiting. That was their number one thing. And it took us a while for, to get them to be convinced that this was important. Now, a few years later, they're on our team. But the point is that current solutions are really focused on solving one or two of these problems. And the third, they're like, you know, let's use Norton. What we argue is that there's an opportunity to rethink sort of what Jules said on the 101 holes problem, that we should really think about making solutions that solve all three. And thanks to this emergence of digital manufacturing or connected to digital manufacturing, we believe that there's an opportunity right now to do that. Essentially what we want to do, and this problem's actually been solved for physical systems in the context of PCV manufacturing. So there's already a thing called functional testing, right? So they outsource the production of these PCBs, and I'm not going to sit there and check every solder connection of every chip. So instead, right, we have these functional testing systems where we pass logic through the system. We functionally test it and get a response, and we're basically searching for embedded trojans in the physical system. And so that's that functional test that I want. Well, for a physical product that I put on an airplane, a functional test means go fly it until it breaks, right? So we, need, we can't do that either. And a non-destructive technique maybe doesn't do the functional test because there might be hidden defects, as we've seen. <coughs> so we sought out to search for that, and we met another mechanical engineer, a good friend of ours, Pablo Terrazaga, in our department in, at Virginia Tech, who's working on structural health monitoring. So structural health monitoring is putting a, smart materials like piezo sensors and actually, let's say, putting them on a giant wind turbine blade. And that lives on that blade, and you basically send it, send it an electrical signal, and that piezo chip vibrates. It's this little thing right there. It actually sends a high-frequency vibration. And since it's an uh, electromechanical uh, material, it actually sends out that vibration, and then it returns. It also reads its own vibrational response back, and that's a, an electrical signal out. right? So, you know, you can't have a lecture from a mechanical engineer until you see like a dash pot system, right? So it's, just, it's a mass spring damper system, that's all it is. And on the wind turbine blades, you put that on there and it lives on the turbine blade. And as a crack evolves, you sort of pulse it every day and then all of a sudden that signature changes, right? Because it's a measurement of the fundamental physical characteristics of the system. It's mass, it's stiffness, and it's damping which means if my shape changes, or if my density changes, or the material properties change, that vibrational response changes as well. So for structural health monitoring, it exists already, but it's all about leaving that sensor on the part. We thought, well, could we use it as a non-destructive technique? And so, uh, the answer to that, whoops, looks like the video system here too. So what this looks like, these are 3D printed uh, specimens, these little impeller blades, and a few of them actually have embedded defects. So what the system looks like is a piezo sensor, it's already mounted to the part, and you can connect it to an impedance analyzer. We're sending a frequency uh, sweep, and uh, we actually get a signature change. So if we have a known good part, a part that we've x-rayed, that we've destructively tested, we actually have a known good signature, from every part thereafter, I should just simply be able to put the same sensor on and run that same frequency s s uh, sweep. And if I get a different signature, that means that part is defective. So what we're doing is a proposing a new NDE technique, not one that's just based solely on shape, like a 3D scanner or uh, embedded flaws, like a CT scanner. We should be able to detect even material property changes with this part. Because again, if anything about that part changes, mass, stiffness, or damping, we should be able to detect it simply by comparing the impedance response. So we sort of worked towards that, and we found in our early work in that space, so we have a root mean square deviation of that curve, a pretty simple way just to sort of quantify the differences in the curves. We see that you know, baseline part, so known good datums, as long as we compare a flaw against that datum, we can see a change in that response and then show that we have a defective part. So this is a technique, for example, that can be used not only to do traditional quality control. Hey, look, your machine had a bad day. Your raw material supply was bad. It led to a bad uh, property. It also, because of the inherent nature of the sensor, can detect these kind of defects that we've shown, the vulnerabilities, the cyber physical attacks. So for example, we can detect internal voids, which other traditional techniques can't do. Of course, some people might be saying, well, yeah, you can find internal defects. It's called CT scanning. So we actually partnered, I got some help from Northrop Grumman who was very interested in this. Uh, so they actually printed some parts out of aluminum for us. These are 3D printed parts. And we chose a, just a random geometry that reflects sort of generally the kinds of complex shapes you might see in a 3D printed part. 
the kinds of complicated shapes where only CT scan will allow you to truly inspect because of it's all these internal features. But also the kind of geometry that just because of the physical, you know, the physics of CT scanning could hide flaws like beam scattering, large dense parts uh, where you can't, you actually, we have embedded flaws in here that we can't detect, like these shadows here. That's a CT scan defect. We actually can't interrogate that. But with our technique, we can. So we can use that sensor to say, okay, we've got two controls. We have data that's a red and blue line. Those are good. And we have a defective part, which is a completely different signature. So again, as a non-destructive post-process technique, we're able to, and again, we use a root mean square. So you can see that control to, control to the control, they're pretty good. But when I control, uh, check against the defective, not so good. I'll take a quick moment as a foreshadowing. You'll notice that this isn't exactly zero. These aren't matching perfectly. We'll come back, Jules will come up and talk to us about why that might be interesting too. So that was cool as a post-process check, but as manufacturers, we wanna catch the problem in the act. So we started looking at side channels, and you all know what side channels are, but you might think of them as off, you know, off, offensive kind of techniques. I'm gonna take you know, physical measurements of the system while it's being used, and I'm going to infer a physical behavior and then use that to, my, to exploit later on. But what we started looking at was actually side channel as a defensive technique, applying sensors into manufacturing systems. And again, if I have a known good manufactured product at no nominal behavior, I should be able to use embedded sensing, acoustic data, vibrational data, even the impedance sensor, or embedded cameras. If I know what a good part sounds like when it's being made or shakes like when it's being made, every other part after that should sound and shake, smell the same way. Right? So that's what we started working on, is these low cost, uh, offline or air gap sensing packages that can be embedded into uh, at, at, uh, manufacturing systems. As Jules mentioned, it's not just about these manufacturing systems running and not want to be taking offline because of cost, which is very true. It's also because the manufacturer says, this works. It took us a decade to get this, this system to run at full capacity, all time, nonstop. And I'm not going to upgrade from Windows XP to Windows 2000 or whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, Windows 10, because it might make my system not work anymore. So it's, that's what they're afraid of. So we also are looking at side channels because we believe it's something you could, in theory, attach to any existing system, whether it's a 2000, you know, quarter million dollar 3D printer made yesterday to an old CNC machine being you know, made 50 years ago. So we actually use that same impedance monitoring technique. And the cool thing is in the post process, we actually stuck those sensors onto the parts after they were made. The nice thing about 3D printing is you can pause and stick stuff on the inside of the part and then keep printing. So we actually can embed those sensors so that they can never be taken off. And so as you can see, we have a nominal part. So this is the nominal part here with a little uh, embedded void where we put the sensor. And then we actually had a sample part. We actually embedded a flaw uh, as it printed up. And so this red line, this is a layer by layer chart. And this is a little heat map. So blue and green is good. And this is where the flaw begins. And 50 layers later for this specific polymer, we're able to detect a change in impedance response. So we found a way to do in situ as it's printing, say, hey, wait a minute, you've got a problem. And, and it actually abort the print. On the subtractive manufacturing side, we actually use a real part. It's called a spool valve. It's a really sort of simple shape that you can make on a lathe, but it's used in pretty much every hydraulics actuation process, especially for large scale equipment, like let's say in a landing gear, and outfitted our lathe, high maze lathe, with accelerometers, dynamometers, uh, thermocouples, et cetera. And we can actually, as the manufacturing process of that uh, geometry is being made, we can actually sense and collect data. So here's a video of that happening. The process itself. Whoops. These are side channels that are being... There we go. Jules could explain it better than me, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah, so that you've got the camera mounted there. There's a tool. And what's happening is this cylinder is spinning very rapidly. Uh, and so it's just a static, right, static tool, moving part, and we're making that spool valve. And so you send it that G code, but in that piece of malware that we talked about earlier, that's been inserted actually where that diameter is just slightly different. So we don't get the tolerance to quite fit. And uh, this is just uh, the dynamometer. I think the, actually the motor power, we actually can, just monitoring that power, we can detect a change in behavior and detect that attack. But we can also detect attacks um, 
let's say, in the amount of force we apply, which actually changes the material properties of a part. It's called a white layer, where I put so much force onto a part as that's being machined, I actually change the microstructure and change the mechanical properties of the part. So we've also been doing that in additive as well, actually using embedded sensing on the machine to actually monitor laser power, laser scan speed, so that actually at the end of every print, we can actually recon digitally reconstruct the print uh, after, it was, after it was made to actually reconstruct the build, every laser vector, so we know exactly how the part is being made, and we can therefore, if we know what a good part is supposed to be scanned like, we can compare every print afterwards like that. What's interesting about this system is that the manufacturer of the system is actually, that's actually came out of a DARPA program for quality control. Actually, more specifically, in the world of additive, the cool thing about additive is we can watch every single cubic micron being made. We know the laser power of every point along that product. So at the end of the print, we have like two terabytes of data where every voxel, we know exactly what happened, the birth of that product. We don't know that for machining or casting or any other manufacturing process. And so we believe that we should be able to use that data actually to check every print afterwards, to check not only for quality, but of course also security. So that's a pretty cool idea, right? We've got our out of the manufacturing systems in this case, it could be any manufacturing system. We have instructions that, go, that digitally get sent in, and it's not just about tool path, in other words, what defines the shape, but we also have the process parameters, the feeds and speeds, or laser power, scan speed, that define maybe the material properties, right? And then embedded into that system, as we saw, we have, you know, as we've intercepted, the firmware, the things that tell it its limits, how hot it's allowed to go, um, its preferred performance, and we've been showing you can attack that, um, and also the in, in situ monitoring, right, where we're telling the user, hey, you asked me for 15 watts, I'm giving you 15 watts. The problem is, as Jules showed you in our red teaming, every single step of that has been attacked. You, there is no root of trust. Even the user, maybe you can't trust. But the cool thing that we're talking about, these side channels, is you could have a side channel system where you've got embedded sensing in the system, but of course that has to be air gap too, right? I, don't, I can't let it be connected to the network. I want it to be a standalone system, I, and I don't want some piece of malware to come in and affect these measurements like I can already here. So, but the problem is, in my data package, I need to be able to tell the machine, for this part, these are the kinds of behaviors you want. And I need you to check against what you get. So if I'm doing this, that's a big no-no. I can't, because that's now, I, this can be intercepted and can be uh, fooled, spoofed. But also, this is where all my IP is. Like, this defines my part. This is actually the most vulnerable piece of data I have, because it not only tells you this is the part, it also tells you what I check for. If you know what I check for, that tells you exactly what to attack, or maybe what not to attack, and attack all the other stuff I don't care about. So how do you get an ability to check the performance against a spec that can never be transmitted? So we're actually, this is again a case where Jules and I and the team came together to apply cyber principles to the physical world. So we propose a thing called the physical hash where what we're gonna do is embed this data package, elements of this data package, into this data package and, and train this system to look for this hash to check its performance against the known good. So the fundamental question I'm trying to answer here is, if my side channel me measurement system is air-gapped, uh, how can I securely tell it what to check without telling everybody else? And this is actually not just about IP. This is a real world thing, right? Where, as we saw, that uh, additive manufacturing company that we went to check, that's a service bureau. They print parts that go fly on airplanes. They're not the designer of that airplane. The reason why they're not, they have to be connected to the internet is because they receive an email from Boeing or you know, anybody, Northrop, print this part for us. Okay, you mail it back. And they trust the quality of that. <clears throat> so. Uh, and if in the future of the deployment, let's say I'm flying an airplane, I know a part needs to, be, is about to, needs to be repaired, and I'm flying to Taiwan, I want them to start printing that part before I get to the ground. But it's not, I don't, and I actually, as a Boeing, I don't want to own that company, that's too much hassle. That's, I want it to be the machine shop. So I want to send them the part and have them make it. But how do I know that part's good? And I don't want them to tell them how I know it's, how I define good. So we call this the physical hash, 
And the way this works is, as a designer, I define, of course, the STL file, the shape, uh, the this, this shape, and I deliver the machine code. But I'm also going to, from my known good, define the parameters that make it good. And I'm going to hash those parameters using a traditional hashing technique. And then I'm going to turn that into a physical system, what we call the physical hash. And what we're going to show you is a QR code that I'm going to print next to it. Now, the manufacturer is only going to receive that and print it. But offline is, a, uh, is a, uh, the side channel measurement system that has a database of all possible performance parameters. It's going to read what's printed, this physical hash, hash it itself, and then compare the hashes. So now I have a way to actually know if something's good or not without ever knowing, without any, the manufacturer ever knowing what I define as good. All right, so one more time. I define, a, uh, I define up front a tolerance uh, system, a database for that, and I define that as part of my geometry, my spec, and I send that out as a printable object. And the key idea here is one of the things we hit, you know, a hash, in, this, in the cyber world, a hash is a hash. I'm only hashing a known string. It, can, it doesn't need any tolerance or variance. It's always going to be the exact string. But in manufacturing, I have to account for the variability of the manufacturing process, the inherent noise in the system. So instead of hashing one line, let's say like the temperature is 150, I actually just want to define my acceptable range. So what we're hashing actually is an acceptable range. That's the variable that we hash. So it allows us now all of a sudden a new idea in hashing, not a discrete you know, spec, but actually a range of specs that it's allowable. Um, so let's skip to. Don't you have to also make certain um, that you don't push all the parameters to their maximum value? and therefore cause the catastrophic failure. So I can, just like in manufacturing today, I'm allowed to upper, operate up to the edge of what I deem acceptable. That's just like how we operate quality assurance in manufacturing, right? And I'm, I have allowable ranges, and I define, as soon as I exit this allowable range, I'm going to have a flaw in my part. So this works both for quality control and for cyber. So the manufacturer, all the manufacturer does is receive this encrypted file and hits print, and the system automatically checks against that hash, and all it does is give me a go, no go. Okay, so let me skip to the video, because that's where the fun stuff happens. This makes it a little bit more clear. So this is a high-speed video of a printer, and uh, in this system, what we're measuring actually is um, the temperature. So what's being sent, as I read in the print, I'm gonna hit pause here, <laughs> sorry. In the print, I'm going to go back. In, so I'm printing, and I have a thermocouple that's measuring temperature. I'm also monitoring the amount of time it takes to create a layer. And in that print, I'm taking that side channel system is actually taking all those measurements, and it print uh, it hashes that and compares it against the known good hash, which represents all the good parameters. So in this case, all my tool pathing, my layer time checks out, but my extrusion temperature was wrong because that defines my material properties. So the system is actually going to hash what's known and compare it against the uh, good hash. And it has a mismatch. And bad, you know, it knows, hey, bad things have happened. Right, so the physical hash is what was given. That was what was printed. This is what was monitored. And everything checked out except for this one piece of the string. That hashed incorrectly. That comparison says no. The cool thing is not just QR codes. One of our new work that we haven't what we're about to publicly talk about right now is actually saying, you know, we could actually use this side channel as a way to talk. So we could print, we could be monitoring everything about it, and in the middle of the print, we'll actually step away from the part. Those tones are actually in a new alphabet we've defined. So we're actually using the side channel measurement as a way to feed that hash forward. So we don't need the cameras all the time. So we actually know on these kind of printers that the t we actually can play tones depending on stepper motor motion. So that all of a sudden spoke a hash to us. So we have embedded microphone. That's now a way to transmit the known good hash. So those are some of the kinds of ways that we're playing around with marrying cyber principles to the physical world through you know, our knowledge of the process. And Jules is going to tell you about some really interesting work we have coming forward along the same theme. So. I'll do this uh, really quickly because I know we're probably getting close on time. This is, you know, in that the set of three circles. One of the things we didn't talk a lot about was counterfeiting. Um, 
which it turns out counterfeiting is a really hard problem. If you're producing an airplane like the 787, 60% of it is produced by other manufacturers. So they have this big distributed supply chain. So one of the things you'd really like to guarantee is that the part that you're getting and that you're physically holding this specific instance of the part was really produced by the, the source that I wanted it produced by and that any certifications about that part um, are legitimate. So if I get this part and they say I CT scanned it and I'm sure that it doesn't have this, these defects, that is something that really is important to me before I put it in the physical system. The problem right now is in the physical world we rely on things like serial numbers and VIN numbers and other things that get physically put onto the part, but anybody who has possession of that part can simply copy it and produce 10 copies that have the exact same serial number or VIN number. And so they can claim that that certification is for their part, that they cloned the serial number onto, and there's nothing I can do to detect that that's a different part. So how do we fix this problem? So one of the interesting things that we realized was that this uh, idea of the impedance signature, this piezoelectric measurement for parts, one of the really painful things that we had to deal with is every single instance of a part um, has slightly different signatures. So you take one particular type of part, like that impeller that goes into a fuel pump, and you print perfect copies of it. Every single one of them will have minute variations in the signature. And what we realized is that this is a unique identity for almost any physical rigid part is you can actually go in and measure this impedance signature and it will be different. Um, and now this is one of some of our ongoing work, but we, realize, we think and we're, we're trying to prove right now that this is a physically unclonable identity function. So if I have this piezo attached to a part, it produces a digital identity that I can read off of the part that nobody else in possession of that part can go and clone. Um, now the reason for this is a, because there's a whole bunch of really interesting noise that shows up and affects this identity. One is just every one of these little piezoelectric sensors has its own embedded manufacturing noise. So this is an example of all these different sensors measuring sort of the same thing and they all at different wavelengths start behaving differently. Mm -hmm. um, you can also, when you manufacture parts, just subtle differences in the manufacturing will change that signature. So every single little you know, nut or bolt will end up having slight differences, but they're all tend to be stable. That's what we're also proving, but right now we think they're all stable. Um, and so this gives me, if I have a physical part, I can go and measure it and know its true identity that cannot be changed as long as the part is in the correct state. So what this allows from a cyber side is suddenly we can do something really interesting. We can take well-known cryptography techniques like public key infrastructure and we can begin asserting information about a part. So I can take the identity of a, uh, of a part, an impedance identity, I can combine it with some cyber information like I'm the IP holder and this is a legitimate copy. So the manufacturer produces the part, they measure the impedance signature, they send it to me as the, um, the IP holder, I take my private key and I sign the combined message with those two and I then distribute that message to whoever wants to see it. So then anybody that gets that physical part can read off the impedance signature, can go look at my public key as the IP holder, and they can verify that that is a valid specific part that I agreed to have produced. Um, they can look at the source, so man the manufacturer can go and create their own signature for a message that says, I am the source of this particular part identity. Or you can have quality control, like CT scans and things attached to it as well. So the nice thing is that it can be all kinds of things and it can go throughout the, the, the manufacturing supply chain. Um, it can be distributed and so you can have different parties coming and go essentially contributing different pieces of information that are attached to a specific physical part. And then the last thing I just want to leave you with um, on this that's a really exciting thing to me about it is it's this true um, cyber physical um, information assurance. And that is because if I take a part and let's say I file it down a little bit, that will change its impedance signature. And so then that signed message that somebody else generated saying I CT scanned this part will no longer match the impedance identity in that signed message. So if I take a part, I CT scan it, I say it's correct, and then along the way somebody else goes and damages the part, either intentionally or unintentionally, it should change um, the impedance signature and then invalidate all of the assertions that were attached to it before. So this is an exciting new thing that we're currently in the process of working on. There's a lot of work with 
how does this work with different materials and different circumstances, handling, how stable are these identities over time? But it's a really exciting thing um, that has come out of this research. So a lot of thank yous and one of them to Dan because Dan helped make all of this research happen um, when he was at DHS um, and to NSF and other folks like you know, Dave who, who helped out. And so, you know, thank you so much for, for your time and appreciate it for inviting us here. Uh, so I don't know if we have time for questions or we're over. Yeah, no, no, this, this, we should do at least a couple questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with a company called Eventize, whose business mm -hmm. model is basically to address a lot of the issues in, uh, in the software as a service platform? Sure. So uh, from my knowledge, Eventize changed their business model recently. So it originally started out as a, essentially a cyber way, cyber only way, like a DRM of STL files. <laughs> So solving vulnerabilities, uh, checking um, authorship of the digital file. Now their business model has changed more to a way to, um, yeah, securely, oh, yeah, distribute STL files uh, through, I think they have an app-based system. There's another great company called Identify 3D that is stuck to this original business model of uh, rights management of both toolpath files and um, STL files for additive and for subtractive. So again, those are great cyber solutions to the upfront piece of the digital thread to make sure that the files, because uh, one of the challenges we have is I'll give a file to a company, hey, print me five copies. Right now, there's no way to make sure they only print five. They could print 30. With these kinds of s solutions, they, do, that they provide an answer to that. Uh, what uh, we do, we've done some interesting work with Identify 3D. One of the things that they'll talk about is that they don't currently have a solution on the cyber physical side. So w once that gets broken down, you have a bad actor somewhere, or some, someone finds a way to subvert that, or let's just say someone's on a malicious firmware attack on your machine, that's where this kind of solutions can work. That cyber physical intersection is our focus. Yep. Great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you talked about attacking waves and attacking printers. Is there anything you couldn't get into? No. <laughs> we didn't find anything that we yeah. looked at. We had a limited amount of equipment. There may be great stuff out there, but we we did not see it in what we looked at. Yeah, so the thing about manufacturing is that it, I mean, one thing, one reason why 3D printing took off, and one reason why CNC machining works so well is they open, they operate on open standards for uh, protocols. G code, STLs, that's why they're so successful. So we don't want to shut those down at all. That's not the point. Um, and yes, obviously, some of those OEMs now are fixing the fact that they have unencrypted transfer of layer information over the Wi Fi. Uh, but we also have to think about companies like Carbon 3D, if you guys know them, uh, all of their machines, you cannot own that machine. It's a leased machine because they want all the data. It's the Tesla model. They're gonna take all the data in and up, update the firmware as they go. That's the future of manufacturing. We want to enable that openness. Um, but yeah, we didn't find anything we couldn't hit. And, and we talk about this 250K machine and it's not to be like, uh, oh, look how fancy we are. It's to point out these are real manufacturing equipment. This is not like me and my MakerBot or my, you know, whatever, Prusa hanging out. It's a real manufacturing platform. Um, yeah, yeah, Dave. So is anyone looking into the patch or update problem that you talked about? Because it seems to me that we can't, I mean, you detect an issue after the fact, but we also have to prevent and be able to remediate uh, such issues. And so it seems we, we can't have manufacturing systems that can't be patched or updated for, for too long. I, well, so I'm, I'm at Vanderbilt, and Vanderbilt's medical center just transitioned to new version of Epic after like a year of planning. And so I think that I think that the, at least from my perspective, the manufacturing model looks closer to that right now, like closer to what healthcare is like. I don't think that it's been solved well, and maybe partially because you know we have so, you know. Because of our inability to predict how software changes are going to behave, you know, and how they're going to impact an existing system, when it impacts the physical world, people get really funny real fast, you know, and you know some I think I think some cyber physical systems producers are better at it than others, and I think on the manufacturing side they're just really not used to doing that at all, and having that risk of of the cyber software could mess up our manufacturing floor. So I I haven't seen anybody doing it, but I think it's a critical interesting problem, particularly in cyber-physical systems. Yeah. Yeah. What 
So, right. so, and you alluded to this at the very end. I mean, in your new direction, right? The the signature. The cool thing is, what I what I heard from that is, even if I do a little modification while the, the parts in transit, I can detect the difference. The flip side of that seems to be over time, you know the, you know, and and, that, and you, I think you started to say like, okay, how stable is that signature yeah. over time? Yeah. And that. So, do you have any early results on that, or what, what is the... We don't know yet. Okay. Um, so there's some interesting ideas, like, you know, Chris said we can print it into the part, you know, uh -huh. and it lives with the part for structural health monitoring purposes. The other idea is, well, maybe you can detect, you know, um, when it's used, and you're being, it's being pawned off to you as new, oh, okay. potentially. We don't know, or, or the other kind of interesting thing is, like, if from a counterfeiting perspective, we don't know that it's going to be perfectly, uh, we don't know that it's, that it's completely unclonable. There may be, like, if you produce a million parts, it may be possible that somebody could end up having a collision yep. of the part, but they have to physically produce something, so guessing is expensive. And the other key thing is that when you have the impedance identity is also correlated with quality. So in order to guess correctly and collide with an existing part, you have to produce a part of equivalent quality. So it really hurts the counterfeiters who can live off of like, I want the lowest cost part that gets accepted and sold. Now they have to produce at least as high quality um, as the others. But then there's other. Yeah, and you can use that to your advantage. So we are excited about the idea of embedded sensing for the future of the product. So you going back to its original intent as a structural health monitoring, as it goes through the air, you know, airplane and it's every landing, I can check and make sure it's healthy. And as the signature changes, but I still deem it's, it's healthy, I can update the key, uh, right? And I could also use it to my advantage uh, along the supply chain. What if I don't want the original supplier to hold the key? I only, as an integrator, I want the key, I want to be the key holder. So as I receive the part through the, uh, through the digital thread and through the physical thread, I actually take a little and just make a permanent defect that's not structurally damaging, but now I now own the master key because I've changed it on purpose. Wow. It's fun stuff. We <laughs> get really excited. Yeah. Well, we should probably uh, wrap up. But thank you guys so much. Right. Thanks so much, you all.